Hello there and welcome to this week's Granny's Garden. In actual fact, it's the last garden tour and it's my farewell to the YouTube journey. So I want to take you today on a little tour around the garden and sort of have a look at each of the borders to see where it started, where we are now and what I want for the future for this garden. So we bought this house four years ago. Halfway up a mountain, fell in love with it. The traffic was four-legged and even the people clipping the hedge, again, four-legged. Fantastic, fell in love with it. The first thing we did was spend virtually the entire year reforming the house. Now if you're buying a house, I would recommend this to anybody. Concentrate on the house first. If you have to repaint it, reform the kitchen, reform the bathroom, put in new windows, whatever you're going to do, do it. And meantime, every day, with that gardener's eye, go out and have a look. Look at the light, how it changes during the season. Are there any perennials that are hidden below the ground? Because I arrived here in winter. And of course in winter, most of the trees are deciduous, most of the shrubs are deciduous, and they all look dead anyway. It looks like a graveyard. You don't know what's hidden below. Are there any perennials? In actual fact, there weren't. And if anything's alive or not, you've got to wait till the spring. Then you spot some gems and also some very unpleasant surprises, as I was in. It gave me the heebie-jeebies to have a look at this garden in the first spring. Oh my goodness. It was clear to me that the person who designed this garden more than 20 years ago knew exactly what he was doing. However, there was one fundamental flaw. This was not a permanent residence and this is a high maintenance garden. If you're going to have a holiday home where you're going to visit on the weekend or occasionally in the summer, then you need something that's low maintenance and mainly things that take care of themselves. This was not the case. And they left this property in the hands of a professional gardener. From what I can see, the professional gardener mowed the lawn and hacked at the shrubs. And that was it. There was no weeding, there was no correct pruning, and it was just overgrown, totally overgrown. And a lot of the plants were dead, and a lot of them were sick, very sick. And the few remaining ones were crying out for some tender loving care, definitely some TLC, and please help me, I've been pruned so badly for the last 10 years that I'm suffocating and I'm dying here. Do something. So what I did do was I laid out a three-year plan to recover an elected garden. Could I do this in one year? Of course. It means throwing money at it and possibly bringing in contractors. Didn't want that. There was no rush. Just Miguel and myself, two pensioners, on our own backs, so doing things bit by bit, it just goes to show you what can be done if you don't get obsessed with it. Baby bites. Baby bites. You'll get there in the end. So, three year plan to recover the electric garden, and unfortunately I only recorded it two years and two months, because in the beginning I didn't think about it. It was only when we were under lockdown with COVID, and the really strict COVID in the beginning, I was going up the walls, thank to goodness I had the garden. But I decided to document. I wanted to learn something new. And what's better than filming, editing? It gave me something to do, got me out of my head. Fantastic. And also it documents the journey we've come over the last two years and two months. So there's over a hundred videos and some special editions as well. This is the ball cypress, absolutely delightful, but it's getting in my head at the moment. So as I said, what we're going to do today is do a little tour and show you the past, the present and a glimpse of the future. Now we're going to start in the future woodland area. There was just one word for this. Brambles. Blackberries. It was a huge mass of brambles and it took blood, sweat and tears. I believe you me, I'm talking about blood, literally blood. You'd have needed a medieval armour to get in here and a machete. Bit by bit I hacked in and I eventually got to a guide wire because there was a Russian olive towering what looked like in between the bramble bush and I was saying that's unusual it's the very first time in my gardening life I've actually seen a Russian olive that's straight ha <laughs> ha it wasn't straight I hit the guide wire and said "Ooh, I don't like the look of this as I hacked the bramble further and further back I found out it wasn't straight it came down straight then it dog left off at an angle of 45 degrees and the roots were tipping they were already raised from the ground this was an accident waiting to happen so my hair stood up, I immediately got hold of somebody in the local town hall and said this has got to be taken down now because right outside my house I've got all the internet wires for the entire street. I have cars parked outside, people walking up and down the footpath. This is a danger to life and limb. So I had to go. That was the very first thing we ever did, get rid of that tree. I got rid of a load of things that were sick and dying and that hadn't leafed out well or weren't performing. And then I set about looking at what I had left. What I had left on this side was actually good. I have a lovely Portuguese laurel, in actual fact there are two of them. I had an andina that was very leggy, so I had to reprune that and it turned out lovely. It now produces loads of flowers, loads of berries, year round interest. And behind it I had an Italian cypress. Now if I get round the other side of it, 
you'll see this already giving nice shade to this area. So I could plant some hookeras. I'm trying hookeras. I'm trying helleboras there. They've got potentilia here, which is past its best now. Of course, it's, uh, last month is when it flowers. Absolutely delightful, laden with buds, laden with flowers. And it does give protection as well to that hydrangea behind. As the trees mature, there'll be less and less of that sun. But for the moment, it's only mornings. Because the Japanese maple that's there behind, which is the sango kaka, which I absolutely adore, receives the morning sun. But this is all in the west. The sun that comes in the west gives it complete shade in the hot afternoon sun. And of course, the magnolia, the prunus, protected from the south, protected from the southern exposure. This is in its second year. Can you believe it? A Japanese maple, Sango Kako, beautiful red bark in winter. I pruned it now for the first time this, uh, this last winter. Absolutely glorious. What a tree. What else did I keep? I kept the Mahonias. Now these had been let grow and grow and grow and there was no foliage from there down. So the sun was penetrating from the bottom. So I did a proper uh, rejuvenation pruning on it and got it to cover in right from the bottom, right to the top, which is what these plants should do, unless you're actually looking for a tree form. And then tucked in here was another Nandina Heavenly Bamboo. And it looks lovely there. The only thing I have to keep making sure is that the top remains airy and doesn't become too congested. Because this needs to be covered from the bottom to the top, but never have a congested feeling. You don't need that sort of airiness up above. Next thing I kept was the Forsythia. This was in a mess, a complete and utter thicket. And it's taken these last two years of rejuvenation pruning to get it where it is now. As you can see, all of them are now whips. There are none of the original whips left there, or stems or branches or trunks, whatever you want to call it there. All of them are new, all of them are beautiful, and all of them will flower from the very top to the very bottom. This is what a Forsythia should look like. Beautiful, open. It needs to be differentiated from other things like the Nandina, which is a typical bush shape. A Forsythia has one moment a year, that month, month and a half when it flowers. And then it turns into a pretty boring tree, but at least it has some interest when it's like that. When the wind blows, it moves backwards and forwards. Those whips move backwards and forwards, and it's quite delightful. It makes it different from the other bushes. Then I put a little sculpture in. This is my little fairy sculpture done by Tonya Clifford in Ireland. She sent it over to me. And it's absolutely delightful. I absolutely love her. When the sun catches her in the morning, she is absolutely delightful. So she sits on a little rose bench. And above her, you'll see there's a dead tree. Now this is, or was at some stage, I presume a mountain ash because of the shape of it, I can see it's a mountain ash. And I'm not going to cut it down. What I'm going to do is remove the top part of the limbs. I'm going to use the bottom half to support something. Now I did buy one of these rose arches to plant above the fairy. But honest to goodness, it is so difficult in Spain to find something decent. I die with envy when I see you all in the United States and the United Kingdom. And you have these wonderful, strong structures. These are so flimsy. I mean, there's just hollow tube and they're supposed to be welded together. They all come apart. It's absolutely disgraceful. They're cheap and so flimsy. I mean, a rose is a strong thing. When it starts to grow, it's going to push on it. And if it's going to push the structure and break it apart, what's the use in having it? I've also started trialling out some ground cover plants. Unusual, this one. This I actually love. It had little pink flowers. This is a blue mouse ear hosta. They're very small. It's in the very, they've only just been planted. But what I do like about them, can you see the leaves? They've got almost no slug damage. Other, I've got hostas in another area of the garden and they are absolutely ripped to shred like lace curtains. But these have got very little slug damage. Look, there's occasional, there's a nibble there. But if you look at the five I planted, that's the only one that's been nibbled. And the other thing I've been trying out, obviously, is Lady's Mantle, and it seems to love its life here. So I'll definitely be planting more of that. And Brunnera, which is over here. The other thing I planted here was this uh, Circus Canadensis, but this is a dwarf one. This is Little Woody. And I didn't like the shape for it when it came. I'm going to try and prune it into a better shape, but it's got the typical little heart-shaped leaves. And of course, we'll have that beautiful, beautiful autumn color. It won't grow very tall. It'll be an understory tree. And then of course, behind it, beside the fence, I have got a camellia. This is the Sasanqua. And very tiny, very cheap, but it'll grow. And it's a dead, healthy looking shrub. It did flower its head off, little as it is. And of course, that'll grow up and cover that fence as well. Turning around, I've got the backside of the Mahonia with the new growth there at the top you can see. 
I've got an abelia which I had to completely rejuvenate it was an absolute tangled mess and coming through here I also planted an oak leafed hydrangea that obviously when it grows up is going to provide more shade from the south to make sure that that Japanese maple is well protected so the future for this area let the abelia grow up to about here about the six foot the elite oak leaf hydrangea the same this beautiful Japanese maple is going to grow up and fill in this area here. The Circus canadiensis little woody will grow up here. The Forsythia is topped out mainly where it's going to be. The ground cover plants, I'm going to plant them en masse now next spring and let them take over. I do have bulbs planted here because these are deciduous trees. There's a lot of light here in spring. I've got lots of daffodils and then later when things start to leaf out, then appears the bluebells. And of course what I'm going to be working on is planting more ladies mantle, more brunnera, more little mouse ears, hosta mouse ears and let this floor cover be completely covered by ground cover. The future for the dead mountain ash is to get the top chopped off and I'm going to plant a climbing hydrangea and let that spiral up it. It'll take a few years and top off around about here and look absolutely glorious in the summer months. This will become more and more like a woodland and with the next sort of like three years we'll begin to see things join together, a shade canopy forming and it'll be different in summer than in winter, more light in the winter, less light in the summer, but that's what I'm looking for, a little woodland area. Then we're going to move on to the shrub border, which is just behind me. This was a mass of overgrown and very badly pruned plants. There were five Forsythias and four Viburnum tenus. Now, I'm the first to say there is room in every garden for a Forsythia, but not five, and of the same variety. This is the Viburnum tenus, did a complete rejuvenation pruning it, taking it right back, clearing it out, decongesting it, and now it's probably about the eight foot mark, which is where it's going to top off and it's getting wider. It is also covering this shade cloth or privacy screening behind, which is what I'm looking for. So it's come on very, very well. It flowered beautifully. And of course it's got its little berries preparing now for the autumn. One Viburnum tenus you should have. Hard as nails, tough as nails, very difficult to kill them, but again, not five. They do reseed and propagate very easily, so you've got to be very careful. Definitely not something to have in a low maintenance garden because you've got to be wary because you are going to produce a forest of them if you're not careful. If you are careful, that's fine. If you don't want the berries and don't want it to propagate by berries, all you've got to do is once it's finished flowering, cut the flowers off, deadhead it, and that's all you need to do. What I'm looking for on this border is four seasons of interest. This has got in the winter, the closed buds look like little pink pearls almost absolutely gorgeous then they open out into this little white flower and then of course you've got the interest in the autumn in these beautiful little berries which be like a metallic blue blue black and of course it is an evergreen shrub so lots of interest all year round so as i said this is my garden it has to make me happy i wanted one for scythia i had it so i dug the others up i didn't want them i didn't want the viburnum tinus either because they were scattered around here and it looked like a big thicket so i kept the central one rejuvenated it, looks lovely, and then started to dig up all the other tangled mess of plants. At the moment, you can see a privacy screen. Doesn't look very nice, but don't worry about it. The plants I've planted are going to cover it. It's going to be like this. So you literally won't be able to see what's behind it when this grows out and fills out. So the past was for Scythias, Viburnum tinus, and a right clogged up mess. It's a mix of standard trees and shrubs and a few bulbs in the middle and other types of perennials. Now, this is a dwarf ginkgo. It's the marican. Then I have the vanilla fresa hydrangea. I've got two of them. This spent about six months in the hospital. It was looking dire. It's now recovered, so it got planted and it's now sort of budding out. This is one that I transplanted. It's a vanilla fresa as well, getting on very well. Now in its second year. I've got some canna lilies here that are just coming up. These are the dark red leaves with a beautiful red-orange flower. The leaves in front, the sword-shaped leaves in front, belong to an Abyssinian gladiolus, which looks fantastic. Beside it, I have planted the Asser Bihu, which is the sister plant of the Sango Kaku I've got over there. This was only planted this season. Look at the growth this season. And this, of course, will have beautiful yellow branches, while the ones uh, over there, the Sango Kaku, will have the red. Now, the one behind I showed you recently in a video is the one I was most excited about. It came in as a little twig and I said, oh my goodness, but it's getting on so well. I saw this the first time in uh, Botanical Gardens in Bilbao in the north of Spain. It's in a Butilon and this is Thomsonii. And it is a mass of these gorgeous little orange lanterns. I love, not like orange, it's sort of like a, a salmon-y colour with like veins on them. Really pretty. 
then the leaves become variegated. They have actually a virus and they become variegated, which makes them look even more beautiful. Look at all this new growth. Just goes to show you how it's taken and how it likes its new place. So, looking forward to it getting through its first winter, hopefully. Turning around, I've got a low variegated hebe, which is going to come into flower any minute now. Behind it, I've just got some phlox. It will push up as it wants. Beside it, I have another viburnum, but this, of course, is an opalus. It's not going to have another viburnum tinus, but the opalus, the snowball one, is well known. This is the butterfly bush I planted about two weeks ago, and it looks a bit sorry for itself, and I said it would perk up, and indeed it has. So looking very, very healthy. Next to it, coming down here, I've got the Hakuro Nishiki, otherwise known as the Dappled Willow, otherwise known as the Flamingo Tree. Looking nice, open and wild the way I do it. Of course, I will come in and give it a correct prune to keep it nicely contained when the time comes for it to be pruned. This is the Waijila that was lying on the ground. This is the runt of the litter. It looked dreadful last year. It looked dreadful when it flowered this year, but I actually did its first pruning and it's beginning to look a bit more upright now and a bit better. Behind it is a limelight now in a second year, looking gorgeous. And of course, the limelight will again cover this completely, as will the snowball viburnum. Then we've seen this one before. This is the viburnum tinus. This was the festiva maxima, the peony. Behind it is a cotinus. This is the royal purple smoke bush. Beside that is a cornus causa. And then, of course, now I have the beautiful little rose trellis here. That can be flimsy because this puts no pressure on. This is a blush noisette. This is a beautiful old fashioned rose and really flowers its head off. It's now coming into its second flush. It had a glorious one about a month ago and now it's coming in again. Another peony here and in the pot I've got an azalea. This is a deciduous azalea. Over here I've got in a pot. This is a camellia. Now this one is getting on well because it's in a pot and I have manoeuvred it so it's getting the exact amount of shade it should do. But the one in the back is struggling. That's planted into the ground and it is struggling. This is struggling. The leaves are getting singed. It's not doing well at all. Virtually no growth. So it's just right plant, wrong location. Now right beside us, I've got three little Nandinas. We transplanted it. They were in the other side of the garden. We're doing very, very badly. So we transplanted the three of them. They did nothing for the first season and now they've about tripled in size. Again, this is going to reach about the six foot. Coming in behind it, I've got the Coprosma, the mirror plant. This one is Pacific Dawn. The new growth is uh, green with the little pinky edges and this has become a more like darker, almost like a chocolatey brown towards the end of the season. Now along the fence for the moment, I have blackberries, thornless blackberries, absolutely laden with future berries. This is temporary. All of these shrubs are going to grow, they're going to cover this and therefore I won't be able to grow blackberries here. But meanwhile, why not take advantage of the fact that you have a chain link fence, dead easy to fix the blackberries to us and then just cut back the flowering ones the one I have preparing for next year, which is already growing, is going to go off in this direction because here there are very few shrubs and trees. Swinging around to the top of the shrub border, I've got the red twig dogwood. This was actually here but needed a complete rejuvenation pruning because it looked like, I actually didn't recognise it as a, a, a red twig dogwood in the beginning because it was so thick and woody until it leafed out. I said, goodness, let's do a rejuvenation pruning and get this showing its beautiful red branches in winter. In front of it, I've planted a rose of Sharon which is just beginning to bud up now. And of course, last week or the week before, you saw the new little area we've got here of the little succulent patch at the top, which receives very little water. It's well protected, not too much light, so perfect location. So into the top of the patio, I've got volunteer plants. This is by the Grandiflora coreopsis. And above, I have got the Persian silk tree. This is chocolate summer. I absolutely adore this tree. Again, I saw it in the Botanical Gardens in Bilbao in all its glory and all it was blooming, these bright pink fuzzy flowers. Originally, I had planted a wedding cake tree here, another tree I absolutely adore. Did not do well at all. And the reason was I found out, I didn't realise it, that this is a very wet area. So look for the right plant to go. This likes a lot of moisture and it's doing fabulously. It's just in its second year now. I'm giving it support because it got very spindly little trunks until they thicken out. But as soon as it thickens out, I'll let it go. And what a beautiful shade it's going to give here. Lovely, light shade. And of course, I've got the phoenix. Woo! I can see a weed there. How dare you? 
This is the famous European fan pan that poked its way through the snow in the blizzard. Absolutely fantastic. Does very, very well in a low pot there. The future of the shrub border, let it mature. Mature enough so it covers this. I'm going to have year round interest. I've got things that flower in the spring, in the summer, have autumn colours, have berries. Everything all together. Lots of colour, lots of texture, lots of year round interest. Occasionally I've got like, I've got bulbs like the Abyssinian gladiolus. I've got daffodils at the front for very early spring when there's not much going on. I will have to transplant, as I said, that one that's struggling at the back. I'm going to transplant over to the other side of the garden, right up at the top there of the terraces, which gets more shade. And I actually have a very wee tiny baby, nine bark, lady in red nine bark, which I'll plop there, which should get on very well because it gets on well in either full sun or dappled shade. And it does get both. It gets hit by the morning sun and hit by the afternoon by two to four o'clock again. So it needs to be able to take it. So nine bark is going to go there. There will be one big difference and they're coming tomorrow. This I actually have got a contractor coming in tomorrow because I'm going to be taking down this awful, the last of the Russian olives. If you've been listening to my videos over the last year, two years, you know that I hate Russian olives. They're very, very tall, very, very dense trees. They shoot up. Look at the height of that. And it's still got to grow. The wood is very, very dense and therefore very, very heavy. But the ratio between the roots and the heaviness of what goes above doesn't match. If you get strong winds, and we're in the mountains, we get very strong winds, they can tip and they can tip up and fall down. And when something of that size falls down, it causes immense damage. I've got my olive tree there, which I do not want it to fall on top of. So I'm getting a professional in because these trees are very, very heavy, as I said, and we don't have the means, the pulleys or the ropes to do it. Also the fact they've got massive thorns. And the worst thing about these trees, apart from the weight and the danger, they spend their life shedding. They leaf out here in April and from midway onwards they start to shed and they keep shedding and shedding and shedding all the way through until the last leaf falls sometime at the end of November. What a pain and it chokes up everything. Can you see all of this? This chokes up everything. The gravel pathways, round all the trees and the shrubs, and the grass. I'm fed up of having to take the lawnmower out to get rid of this. If you didn't do this almost every two days, you'd be absolutely covered in them and they wouldn't let the grass grow underneath. Do not plant a Russian olive. Now the next border is the rose border, right beside the driveway. Now initially it had an evergreen Mediterranean myrtle, loads of them planted. This is a very narrow border and the Mediterranean myrtle is very wide. So it pushed over onto the grass, you couldn't cut the grass, and it pushed over onto the driveway. You could get the car in, but you certainly couldn't open the doors. So that had to go. It also impeded something very important for me. The very second I walk into my garden, I want to see the view. And this view is gorgeous. So I got rid of that and decided it was going to become a rose border. It had actually two old shrub roses very old, very fragrant roses, but they were planted like together. So I transplanted them, putting one on either end of the new border, ordered in some new to trial out, new landscape roses, and mainly floribunda. I'll give you now the, the results of that. And I had an old alder tree, it was dead. So I chopped the top off it and used this to create a rose fountain using the Lady Banks rose, the Alba, the white version. Now what I did is I trained the rose spiraling around the trunk to try and cover it as much as possible and then let the whips go through like a semicircular wreath form at the top to come out and eventually cascade down. Now it's only in its second season. It did bloom prolifically for six weeks as it is a rambling rose, six weeks. Looked lovely. Oh, it's only in its first season so the flowering is never as abundant as it will be in the future but nevertheless for its first season it's fine and if I get close, getting up close you can see that it's almost covered. You can still see the trunk but it's not that visible anymore. The longer whips, when they get to be this long, I sort of take them in and I spiral them round, leave the shorter ones out. And all of these next year are going to flower. The upper ones are pushed up through that reform and coming down. Some of them are quite long already. By next year, they're going to be even longer and will start cascading down like the fountains. You're going to have beautiful white flowers going up and the white flowers coming down. A beautiful rose fountain. Now I trialled out several roses, I planted as bare root roses. The one I was most impressed with, definitely, 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 Leonardo da Vinci. Considering it's a first year rose, bare root rose, and I pruned it right down, it performed incredibly. Dead sturdy right in the beginning, no floppiness whatsoever. 
and after deadheading it's now about to bloom yet again so this is uh, again one of the ones that blooms perfectly during the season dead please is a dead sturdy right from i need to actually uh, i need actually to put some neem oil on this because as soon as you get the new flush of leaves of course you get the uh, little aphids out the other one i loved was dolce vita Again, it's starting to flush out, getting ready for its second. Lovely sort of like a pale yellow, almost like slightly tangerine color. Gorgeous color. Now, the one I wasn't so over the moon about was the Pat Austin, unfortunately. I had been so looking forward to this because it's one of the few copper roses on the market. I found it to be floppy. The very second the roses came out, the weight of them pulled it down. I couldn't even see them. You had to hold them in your hand and pull them up. And each individual flower didn't last that long. The framework will become sturdier as time goes on. So you would never write something off, the poor thing, in its first year. Didn't make a huge impression its first year, but it'll get, it will get another chance all through next growing season to show me what it's capable of doing. And then if it doesn't perform, then it'll get the chop. But so far, it's growing well. It's getting a little bit sturdier. Yeah, still a bit floppy. But at least the colour of the roses is glorious. Now, what I've underplanted here... I've got col uh, columbine, lots of different varieties of columbine, even the pink petticoat, which is absolutely adorable, the little white and pink. Some of the ones are ter desperately small. This is the pink petticoat, it's only just been planted. Tiny little one in comparison to this one, the yellow one, and in comparison to the this one over here. This is actually a chocolate one, it's supposed to be chocolate, but it's a very sort of a dark purpley one. Very pretty. So the past here, was huge bushes that didn't let you see any of the view. The present is a rose fountain that's almost on its way to being where I want it to be. The future. Let the landscape roses grow to be their mature height, which is about three to four foot. Apart from the columbine, which is already there, I'm going to be planting geum. I've already got here daps and botanical tulips. I've got some irises there also. In a setback, in a, like its own square, I've got a crepe myrtle. This had been massacred, the typical crepe myrtle massacre. So I set about trying to sort it out and encourage branching out below the massacred knuckles to try and hide the fact that it's not pretty anymore. And hopefully it'll never be the same as it should be if it hadn't been hacked and wrecked. But we can certainly do a good job of trying to cover up as best we can, put makeup on so it looks decent. As you can see now, it's all leafing out, it's all branching out. On the end of all the branches at the top and the bottom, we've got loads and loads of buds and the top ones are already open, as you can see up there. So hopefully within the next year or two, that's going to look lovely. And of course, I've still got those glorious, glorious multi-trunk for winter interest. As regard the rose fountain, now that I've got the rose fountain in the right direction, what I'm going to do now is plant clematis this autumn because this has got six weeks of glory. And once that six weeks of glory is over, it's sort of nice, it's wispy, and it's got a cascade, but I want something that winds its way between it and flowers sort of like maybe June, July, August. So I'll be on the lookout for that to get a clematis winding in among this rambling rose. So I'm going to have year round interest there as well. So that's going to be the future of the rose border. We're just going to take a quick trip up the stairs to the side of the house where the Mafeta garden is. Now I just haven't had the time to touch this. There's only a certain amount of things you can do and I was ripping out hedges, I was ripping out uh, invasive vines, I was building terraces. There's only so much you can do. As I said, bite by bite, bit by bit. So what I have done, because it's a very shaded area or dappled shade area, is that I have put shade loving plants in the very, very front, which is not so shade. I've got agapanthus, I've got white one here, I've got the purple one over there. I planted coleus. Different types of coleus, which look absolutely lovely in those macetas. Then I've got the permanent ones here with the Alberta spruce, the little dwarf Alberta spruce with the variegated ivy. Now I make sure that I come in and take strands off about every month to make sure I can see the urn underneath because I want to see that urn. I've got another little group over here with some begonias, some stipitenuissima, some impatience. Again, another coleus. Coleus are doing fabulously here. The amount of light is absolutely perfect for them. And the last little group over here, as you can see, this one is flowering. I've got the agapanthus which gets the sunlight because it's right on the edge. And then of course, further back, I've got this glorious Spanish pot reflecting the color green of the coleus above us. Let's get rid of that. This is what I'm talking about. Do you see these leaves on the ground? 
They've got nothing to do with these leaves up here, which are completely different. These are coming all the way from that wretched Russian olive down at the end of the garden. The Matheta garden I will be working on. I want to bring in some sculptures, but that's what it is at the moment. That's as far as I could guess. There's only so much I can do. The only thing that will be done this winter, as a future, that last bit of ivy is going to be taken down. Thanks be to goodness, and that'll be the end of it, because I'm getting that ivy crawling through the gravel here. And, of course, it's got spiders in it, and my next-door neighbour's actually allergic to spider bites. So we're going to get rid of that. It's going to be the last big job here, and I don't want to see another invasive vine as long as I live. The next part is the terrace, which you can see behind me. This was a major headache for me. I knew what I wanted to do, but I kept pushing it back. It's such a major job. You say, oh, I just can't think about it. I just can't do it at the moment. So I got on with the rest of the garden. But this, at some stage, had to be tackled. This is a three years plan, and the three years was running out, and it had to get done. The top part of it, the past was, the top part was a very, very sick cypress hedge, full of ceridium, that had to go. So that was 80 trees that had to be cut down. Then it was a very steep embankment. I couldn't see myself in 10 years' time, or even five years' time, trying to scramble up that. I mean, it was an accident waiting to happen. I'd probably break my neck coming down it. Nothing would grow there. Every time it rained, the mud would wash on. I was fed up of cleaning up mud from the driveway. And because of the cypress head and the cypress roots, it was dry, it was devoid of nutrients, nothing would really grow there. It was so hard and so compact, it was just a disaster, an absolute disaster. With the help of my wonderful family, we grabbed the bull by the horns and got cracking. First of all, my husband and I removed the actual hedge. Then with the aid of the family, we created the two terraces, moved 84 monstrous, heavy train sleepers, creating the double terrace, and then got on to planting. These are two very long terraces. You would need hundreds and hundreds of plants and quite a bit of money to do it. So, as I said, bite by bite. How do you get around it? Spread them out, put mulch around them, make them look nice. Well, the present I've got on the back wall, four climbing roses. Coming this autumn as bare root, which are a lot cheaper, I've got another six roses for the back fence, all different types. I've got French growers, I've got English growers, I've got German growers. Wonderful varieties coming in as a backdrop to that back wall. I brought in two different varieties of hydrangea, paniculata hydrangea, as my structure. Bobo and Diamond Rouge. They began to crisp up almost immediately, but I didn't get worried. And this is something you won't need to take into account, just a tip. When you buy something in a garden centre, they tend to keep it in the cool or dappled shade because that way it lasts longer and also it's the colour isn't washed out when people are looking at it, it always looks better in the dappled shade than if it's under complete sun. So when it gets brought into full sun, it tends to go, oh my God, what's happening? So it tends to crisp up a bit. Those leaves will crisp up, you might even drop, but the new leaves that come out, already in full sun, will stand up. And that's exactly what's happened. The new leaves that are coming out are working perfectly. And as you can see, the bobos are quite ahead. They now have got uh, the paniculatas forming. The diamond rouge is slightly behind, but again, they're just forming. On the lower part, because I'm looking for something that cascades, uh, I've got sweet alisum planted. Sweet alisum looked dire when I brought it in, but what I was looking for was the seed. I wanted to reseed so it'll cascade over. And I got some really cheap white petunias. On the lower terrace, perennials. I've got gaura. The moment the gauras I've got are pink. Can never find in Madrid white gaura. I have to bring it in by mail order, which arrived actually last night. I'll be planting it this week. Coreopsis does really, really well. Russian sage. Again, as you see, it's very much spaced out. But, and I've also got Rudbeckia. The future. Oh, I forgot about this. This is a silver maple that I had to cut down because it was dead. But the roots weren't dead and I grew it from a stump. That's how it is at the moment. Looking absolutely fantastic. Going right up there. And certainly a great success. Getting back. The future. So as I said, in autumn, I'm going to get the climbing roses coming in as bare roots. I'm also going to be planting... Down here, five of the Leonardo da Vinci landscape roses because I think they're gorgeous and they have performed so well they deserve a place. Then, bit by bit, instead of having individual plants, I'm going to be creating drifts. Next year, maybe get another two and create a drift there. The Coreopsis, create a drift of the yellow that goes into a drift of the blue, that goes into a drift of the Gauras, both white and the pink. Also coming in, I've got daffodils, white and yellow. And I've also got 
Darwin hybrid tulips. The ones that come back again and again and again. They're the only ones I want because I don't like to be planting tulips every single year. So the future is definitely going to be drifts as opposed to individual plants. Cascades of perennials coming over. I've actually planted one of the lemon trees here. It's getting a little bit of a problem because of the light change, but again, it'll recover. And if I can get up close, oh dear, you can see even from last week, it's putting on new little growth there. These are the older leaves that's getting a little bit, woo, you've put me out in full sun. It'll do all right, be fine. I'm also bringing in different types of peonies, both the larger ones and also small little ones for along the edge. The anemone type ones, because I'm looking for here is to soften up the edge. The driveway is so much cleaner now. I can't believe I spent so much time sweeping here and now it's clean the way I like it. I was also asked recently about the lemon trees. I just put them side by side, you can see it. The one on the right was the one that overwintered outdoors and the one on the left is the one that overwintered indoors. Now as you can see, the one that overwintered indoors grew a hell of a lot. But in actual fact, the healthier plant is the one on the right. It's a lot more sturdy, you can see that it's wooded up, it can stand up to anything. Whereas the one on the right is far too flexible and if I had it without the stake, it would probably break. I have my question mark here, I want to see how things go. That'll get overwintered again inside, that's going to remain outside. In actual fact, when they take this tree down tomorrow, in a few weeks time in its place, I'm going to be putting a lemon tree. So I'll have one in the dappled shade area and one over there in full sun. So we'll see as the experiment continues, which one does better, dappled shade or full sun or almost full sun. These two lemon trees sit on top of what was the biggest hidden treasure in this entire garden, my hidden patio. When I bought this house, all of this was lawn, even this area here, and I had no idea what was hidden beneath. It wasn't until the hot weather came that first season that I found grass dying. So I tried the most obvious remedy, increase the water. That worked up to a certain point, but didn't solve the problem. Use more fertilizer. Yeah, not very much, I said. The only other thing that occurs to me is a lack of depth of soil. Nah, no way. So I got my trusty spade out, dug it into the ground and heard a clunk. And I said, I don't believe it. Under here, there is something. I don't know how big it is, but under here, there is something. And I dug out that first, like two or three foot and found a very large slate paving stone. Beautiful, like a blue gray with slight little flecks of orange in it. So I said, let's see how far this goes. And just look how far it goes. Right from that staircase to the side of the house, big large area here and a very, very wide path that goes up to the front door there. Can you believe this was hidden for 10 years under a lawn or what looked like a lawn? This, this is what happens when you get these so-called professional gardeners. Things encroach, do they cut them back like hell? It's like this here. This is so easy. You just pick it up, that's it, that's all it needs. This, if I let it go, would encroach, it would close up. And in 10 years time, you think that was a carpet, a lawn of masses reptans. It's not, it's paving stones with masses planted in the cracks. You've got to maintain it. This opened a whole new area for me. I absolutely got beautiful pots. These pots are absolutely lovely. They're sort of like an old aged pot. I put one dwarf cherry tree because my husband loves cherries. I planted that this season. Hopefully next year, I'm going to have my, my first crop of cherries. I planted the shindesheho, which I absolutely love, Japanese maple. Bright red, or bright pink red in springtime, scarlet in the autumn and in the growing season, it's either green or the new growth, green with pink edges. Lovely, delicate Japanese maple, absolutely adore it. And so we must come to an end. Sometime we must come to an end. This garden has afforded me, because it was in such a neglected condition, it has afforded me the opportunity, particularly in pruning, which you all know is a passion of mine, to show you how to go about rejuvenating something that looked as if it was passed and fit to be thrown out. You can rejuvenate it and get it back to its natural shape. Talking about natural shape, I hope it inspires you to have a look and to try to go for the natural shape that Mother Nature intended. It usually looks a lot prettier than trying to shape it into something it was never meant for. For the moment for me, I've had a past, I have a present, and the future is just letting things mature and enjoying it and maintaining it. I would like to thank you, all of you, that have been faithfully with me all of these two years and two months to see this garden develop and be tamed with a whip out now and again, but tamed nevertheless. 
It's been wonderful, the comments, the company and the friends I've made. I will never forget it and hopefully I will carry those friends through into the future. It was never meant to be a gardening video. It was just cut in time, framed in time. It was a three year plan of which I filmed two years and two months. Once I've come to an end, it's come to an end. There are so many excellent, excellent gardening channels out there that do daily, daily chores and how they plant and how they maintain. It was never my intention to do that. And you've got lots of other inspiring channels out there for other types of gardening. For me, for the moment, again, thank you so much for accompanying me on the journey. It's been wonderful getting to know you, wonderful having you on the journey. And I'd like you to leave you with the Spanish saying, which means until forever. Hasta siempre, amigos.